Jim, in our last session, you talked about uh, intimacy comes out of ex uh, sharing life's experiences. And uh, our most important relationship is with our Father God. Could you give us some insights on how we can also apply that as far as our relationships with one another as Christians so that we could uh, experience life that would accelerate all of what God wants to do in us yeah. and through us. And if I uh, forget that, why well, just uh, interrupt me and get it in. Okay. Because I think the more interaction, the better. <coughs> so we're going. So Jim, we're going. Yeah, so go ahead. So we are recording, Jim. Okay. So, uh, yes, I'll just to repeat that question. Um, as, as we think about sharing experiences with one another, give us some wisdom that might help us to uh, benefit the most from this privilege. And, and I think you're going to be talking about depth of commitment to one another. This is not just casual drinking tea and eating cookies. So share with us how, how we can grow in this area of fellowship and, uh, and significant accountability. Yes, uh, now, <clears throat> it'll clear in a minute, I hope. <laughs> um, John D. Rockefeller, Sr., was the um, richest man of his day. And uh, he made the remark that the greatest thing in the world is Christian fellowship. Mm -hmm. And he said, only Christ can satisfy. Um, this word fellowship is taken from the Greek word uh, koinonia. It appears uh, 13 times in the New Testament and is translated uh, partner, communion, and a whole variety of words. But in the fellowship, uh, it refers to uh, uh, small groups. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, a, a fellowship group. Although uh, I never like to use those words alone because I figure the um, uh, group has a threefold purpose. It's first for support, fellowship, and accountability. Now, um, John Wesley was the first uh, person that saw the importance of this. Mm -hmm. uh, he had, um, I guess, thousands of people converted to Christ under his ministry, but there wasn't any satisfactory follow-up plan. So he organized these small groups, and uh, I'll read here some of the um, uh, requirements uh, to be in one of his groups. He said, um, before becoming a member of such a cell group, the potential member had to agree to some guidelines and activities, which included meeting together weekly. The group must not consist of more than 10 or fewer than five. Each member should feel responsible for every other member. Rather than having a strong leader, Wesley felt, uh, Wesley felt it'd be given too much to do and the rest too little to do. The meeting opened with some present among you to express his own state. Then ask the rest in order as many and as searching questions concerning their state, sins and temptations. A principal purpose for the weekly group was to confess our faults one to another and pray for one another that we might be healed. Wesley expected each to speak in order, freely and plainly, the true state of our souls mm -hmm. with the faults we have committed in thought, word, and deed, and temptations we have felt since our last meeting. The meeting was to end with prayer suited for the state of every person present. Some of the questions those invited to join the group were asked, do you desire that we should tell you whatsoever we think, whatsoever we feel, and what's wherever we hear concerning you. Do you desire in doing this 
that we should come as possible, close as possible, that we should cut to the quick and search your heart at the bottom. Is it your desire and design on this and all to be entirely open so as to speak everything without exception, without disguise, and without reserve? Mm. So you can see that Wesley's requirements were pretty strong. Yes. Now I feel that uh, every Christian uh, should be a member of a group like this yes. because the purpose was to hold each member up to the standards of Christ. Mm. The next person that picked this up was an Episcopalian minister, Sam Shoemaker. And um, uh, he's written a little pamphlet called The Five Tenets of Christian Fellowship. And uh, he said, uh, uh, one of them is the tenant principle of common cause. He said, I have seen small groups start and fall, and why? Because they, because they sought fellowship for itself or for their own satisfaction. We need to look into some uh, one another's eyes with love, with truth, and with trust. Mm -hmm. And then we feel that we both need to look away from ourselves to the huge task that confronts us. All followers of Christ today and vow to one another the loyalty that it takes to storm and conquer and hold mm -hmm. one outpost, outpost in the front line of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of the group, and well then um, Dr. Stanley Jones followed up, and he said the fellowship is never an end, uh, it is a means. The kingdom of God is the end and the final order. So the purpose is not just to build up the group, but to, I like those words, storm, mm. conquer, and hold at least one outpost in the uh, uh, kingdom of God. Uh, Dr. Dick Woodward, a pastor friend of mine for years, uh, established fellowship groups like this at his church. And um, he had an eight-point covenant that he asked them to agree to. Huh. And uh, I'll read most of the points because they're all very important. The first is, your commitment to each individual in your group must be of the spirit that says, nothing you do or say will make me stop loving you. Hmm. Uh, somebody gave me a tape once by a psychologist. And he said, do you want to know what a well-adjusted person is? He said, uh, do you have a confidential relationship with each, at least one person that no matter what you do, think, or say will cause them to stop loving you? Mm. So that was the first point of Woodward. The second prayer, I will pray for each member consistently of confidentiality. I won't discuss anything outside the group that occurred in the group. Uh, the covenant opened us. Uh, I cannot know you and you cannot know me unless we tell each other who we are. Mm. Then the covenant of sensitivity. I will ask God to make me uh, sensitive to the needs of each individual. Then he's got the um, covenant of honesty, a mm. covenant, a covenant of uh, accountability. And then um, uh, he talks about the um, uh, covenant of uh, equality. Mm. And Shoemaker says, the relationship within the group places all the same status. Mm. It was uh, mentioned earlier that we all have a psychological need to be significant. By placing Christians in groups where all are in the same status, Wesley saw an enabling ministry where an ordinary people could make real contributions to others' lives. Mm. Um, now, uh, let's think for a minute. If you want to start a group, mm. what would you do like this? Well, the first thing is to take uh, one of your best friends and say, let's have lunch together. 
So the only commitment you make is that lunch together. So after you've done this a couple of times, you say, uh, now this has been very profitable. Let's do it every week. Hmm. But the second covenant is, okay, we'll meet together once a week. Then uh, pretty soon you say to him, um, you know, I'm having a little problem in scripture memory. Would you check me on my verses? And ask me every week how I'm doing. So if he agrees, then that's the other, the next step in it. And uh, pretty soon, he'll say, um, "Well, I've got a matter I'd like for you to pray about. You know, will you pray about it?" So that's the next commitment. I'll, I'll pray with you about it. Mm -hmm. So it gradually builds up. But the uh, precaution is that uh, you never hold a person accountable in an area that he didn't agree to mm. or ask you to hold him accountable yes. in that area. Now, uh, pretty soon, after two of you get pretty well acquainted, you talk about adding a third. And um, so you agree on somebody. We'll take him for three months on trial because no human being has the ability to discover the chemistry that makes a group fit. And when somebody said, uh, let's start a fellowship group mm -hmm. and let's get so-and-so, never work. Because, uh, uh, you know, you, the chemistry may work and it may not. So you've got to have a chemistry where each person feels this responsibility for others. Um, one example that uh, uh, my daughter went back to the National Institutes of Health for some tests and uh, she left Saturday morning, no public transportation to the airport. So I called my friend and uh, I said, uh, my daughter needs to ride at the airport. Well, I knew that he had no greater priority hmm. than to uh, start up his Mercedes and take her to the airport. So that's part of the covenant of availability. Mm -hmm. You know, just uh, all these covenants there. And these guys will lay down their lives for one another after this. Now, I think about <coughs> David's team in this uh, regard. I see in his team uh, five relationships. The first is the leader has to be willing to lay down his life for his cause. Mm. The second is that the followers must be willing to lay down their lives for the cause. Now the uh, uh, leader must be willing to lay down his life for his men. And then the men must be willing to lay down their lives for their leader. And we see this in uh, uh, David and Uriah. Um, you know, his uh, mighty men, uh, 32 of them he had. I don't know how they work together, but I think uh, they work like a volleyball team. Mm. They put a point man up if the army needed help and kept him there until they got tired. But he had a, a strong man on each side. He never had to worry about him being attacked from the rear. Mm. And when he got tired, they'd rotate. So I remember David uh, told uh, uh, Uriah, uh, uh, turned a letter back uh, to uh, the commander in chief, Joab, and said, put Uriah up to the front and then fall away mm -hmm. and let the enemy kill him. You know, well, that was a, a huge test, I think, for the mighty man. But they so respected David, mm -hmm. you know, we will do that. Well, then the fifth relationship is they must be willing to give up their lives for each other. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my friends, uh, Paul Stanley, uh, in the Vietnam War, uh, his team moved by helicopter. And they had an understanding that they would never leave anybody behind. And even if they got all killed for doing it, and the guy, if he was killed, they'd stay behind. So these relationships, uh, develop that builds the strongest bond I think that's possible. 
because a bond mm. grows from doing battle together. Mm. So uh, you add a third, and then uh, you pray about a fourth, mm. and probably never have more than five or six. And uh, these groups uh, uh, stay together for life, mm. depend on each other. So I used to think that um, uh, everybody should be part of a Bible study and a prayer meeting. Now I think everybody should be a part of a fellowship support and accountability group mm. as well. So this is not a Bible study. It is not a prayer meeting. Mm. It's where people share uh, their needs with each other. And you talked in the beginning about um, shared experiences. Well, that's really what it's about. And uh, pray for each other and each other's ministry. Mm. So um, the fact this word appears 13 times in the New Testament and is translated fellowship 13 times makes me think, you know, that it's very important. So that's what I feel about fellowship, is not getting together and having refreshments. Mm -hmm. It uh, must have the full thing of uh, support, fellowship, and accountability. Some action on both sides of the fellowship. So do you have any questions, Ron, about this kind of a brief look at it? Well, Jim, I don't, uh, I, I sense people are busy. I guess my question would be, we always hear about meeting for a Bible study. W would you say that a, a person, we live in very busy lives, we have so many commitments, would you say that uh, what you just described would be, if you had to choose, Bible study group, obviously refreshments, or the accountability? Can one stand, can the accountability... I would choose the latter because you can do the Bible study and uh, prayer meeting someplace else. So this is the most uh, crucial in my estimation. Mm. Now, uh, I've written down some guidelines for a group like this. And one of the things that I have say, you must set it at a time when you're not hurried. If there's any other person in the group that indicates I've got something more important to do, he doesn't belong in the group. All of a sudden, this becomes a priority. And uh, that's probably early in the morning. It's probably the best time in that. Now, um, I believe in one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, when am I finished with a person, one-on-one? -on -one. It's when I've got him involved in a fellowship, accountability, and support group. Because uh, uh, several people know him, they know his needs, and they can really minister to him better than I can, where there's several people involved in it. So that's the way you graduate from one-on-one, -on -one, is make sure your man is hooked up with a fellowship support and accountability group. Now, Jim, it sounds like uh, this would fit some of the things you've shared, the primary application has been men. What about for ladies, uh, whether they're single or moms or what, what, what changes would you make to accommodate women? Well, the same principle is very valid, I think. But uh, you have to adjust uh, between the uh, uh, the characteristics of men and women. That, uh, you know, the man, uh, his brain is divided. <laughs> and uh, uh, he can only think or do. A woman's brain is not divided. And she can do about six things all well at the same time. So uh, we have to leave a little more room for activity with the women's group, but the principle is very valid. In this teaching on koinonia in the New Testament, there's no uh, indication that it's not for men and women, no gender discrimination. 
However, I think it is better uh, that woman with woman and men with men, because uh, uh, they could probably be more honest and frank that way. Good question. It's uh, going back to something Roger shared. Um, is it possible to meet every other week? Um, we're seeing that to, to have any man make weekly commitments, uh, it's very difficult to keep that going. Yeah. Um, I think um, you agree on a time. Maybe it's once a month, you know, but something that suits all of you, that feels the need. And if you make it once a month, well, you may say, we need to do this more often. Okay. So you might start out with once a month and then allow it to grow into... Okay. Yeah. Uh, most of them I'm familiar with move in that direction. Yes. It's not that it's longer in between, it's closer. Jim, how would a group pick a... Uh, and uh, a target project so that there can be output because that's that's going to finally bind them together. What would be what would be some ways a group could find a outreach point? Well, <clears throat> I've got an example on that. I was down in uh, Brazil with campus outreach three or four years ago, and uh, they had meetings of all the alumni that come out of the uh, uh, ministry in the last three or four years, and they wanted to stay tied in. So they were discussing ideas. And, uh, well, hold a Bible study. And I was pretty brutal with them. Mm -hmm. I said, won't work. If you want to stay tied in, you've got to have a project. And down there, the greatest need is to raise money for new staff. Oh. Maybe it'll be a prayer meeting for needs of the ministry. Maybe it's to raise money. But like Schumacher said, you uh, turn your chairs inward, look at each other. Then you turn around and look outward to the needs of the world. And I like his words that I said and agree that you're going to uh, storm and conquer and hold at least one outpost. And as uh, Stanley Jones said, uh, the group is not an end in itself. Uh, the kingdom is the end. So uh, a group has to have as an objective, you know, we're going to conquer and hold one post. You mentioned earlier uh, sharing things to be accountable. Um, obviously, pray for me in this area. How crucial is it? To, how much time should you spend actually together praying in one of these meetings? Um, well, uh, my uh, guy that I kind of grew up in with this was uh, a real maverick before he became a Christian. And uh, uh, he had a lot of wisdom. And he just, he was a millionaire at 28, you know, he was that smart <laughs> on there. But um, uh, he said, uh, uh, this is also what the Dale Carnegie uh, teaches. Now this priest has written a book. If I tell you who I am, you may not like me. So I won't tell you who I am. But I went to a conference in uh, at Bermuda with Pat and there were about 110 people and during the week everyone had to talk about 10 minutes. So Pat and I sat back and he said, no, uh, take a look. Some of these guys would get up and tell you how they got it made, you know. He said, it turned the crowd off totally. Some of them would get up and talk what they're struggling with, and the people are there. Well, what the Dale Carnegie leadership uh, uh, training teaches is, if you build yourself up, the crowd will tear you down. If you tear yourself down, the crowd will build you up. Mm. So, um, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 said, there's no temptation, but such is common to man. And uh, uh, men get together. Well, nobody's ever surprised by temptation because they've had it themselves. Mm. And nobody's ever perfect. So uh, I think probably 
uh, strength in this is maybe not to get a solution, but just to be vulnerable. So people help you, builds you up. In fact, uh, Lauren Sine, the president of the Navigators for 35 years, I've traveled with him a lot, and he was often called on to speak impromptu. Uh, we'd be in some country. So I told Lauren one day, I said, uh, you're the only pinch hitter that I know that hits a home run hmm. every time you get up to pinch hit as a speaker. What's your secret? And he said, no secret. I figure everybody's alike. I just got to you know, talk about what I'm struggling with, what I'm doing about it. And everybody there can identify. <laughs> Jim, um, how is this working out for you currently? Well, <clears throat> It's hard for anybody to get anybody that will uh, evaluate my character and conduct. <laughs> I don't think of myself as being that intimidating. But uh, uh, out at the uh, assembly last week, uh, uh, Doug Nunke, you know, and they, he's done a series on the wheel. And uh, uh, he came over and said, I don't even want to talk with you in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm that intimidating. Don't but I wish it worked out better, but then nobody uh, uh, challenges me very much. They probably think it, but they don't, I don't know what they're thinking. <laughs> So do you have an, is, do you have an individual or two that you know you can be honest with and that you can have something like this approaching? Um, yes, and uh, this school I'm going to start, I've got a couple of partners with me in this, and uh, that'll be an occasion to get closer to a couple of guys, because we'll have to really work together in it. You have a project, a goal to work, to minister outward. Yeah. Your chairs are pointing outward. Good questions. I like this format. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I don't see much of this happening in the body of Christ among men. I see it maybe among some women, but uh, part of it may be, and Rogers mentioned, it's just the busyness. Uh, there's a lot of motion, but not necessarily this kind of intimacy and this kind of uh, relationship. Well, I have a, a feeling that uh, business is a state of mind. It's not a fact. <laughs> um, John Wanamaker started the best uh, uh, first group of nationwide department stores. So in the, their flag store in Philadelphia, they had a chapel. So he was taking the postmaster general around one day, showing him. He came to the chapel, and the postmaster general said, well, with all this, how do you find time for this? And one maker said, that's not the problem. With all this, how do I find time for this? <laughs> in there. So uh, I often uh, uh, think about if the President of the United States gets more done in 24 hours, it's because he's better organized. He doesn't have any more time than I have. <laughs> so uh, I'm pretty much limited to how well I organize my time. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I like the story about uh, Mark Luther. Ahead, Mike. He uh, looked at his schedule, and uh, he had twice as much on his schedule as he could possibly accomplish. So he said he spent an extra hour in prayer. Well, I didn't talk to this. Uh, he said, I used to think God just sped up everything. 
But he said, uh, I think God just showed him what to leave out. Hmm. And he got everything done he was supposed to. I heard about the uh, landscape artist that uh, was painting a landscape. Uh, a tourist came by, admired the painting, went on his way. Three weeks later, he came back and uh, looked at the picture, and he couldn't see the change in it. And he asked the artist, uh, well, I see you haven't made any progress since I was here three weeks ago. He said, I've made a lot of progress. And he said, well, I don't see any change. He said, well, in fact, I haven't touched the screen. Well, how do you say you made progress? He said, in painting a landscape, what do you leave out? It's just as important mm. as what you put in. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't like to refuse anything. Um, I've had to fire a couple of lawyers in my day because they're so interested in getting new business that they never can tend the old business. <laughs> All the time, there's got to be a time they've got to stop and work on the business yeah. they got if they're going to keep my business. <laughs> so, a business is really a state of mind. Yes. Um, I had an aunt that uh, developed TB and had to go into a sanitarium. And I was in the Navy in California, and I used to go see her when we were in port. But she never wrote a letter to me. I kind of exhorted her, why don't you write to me? She said, well, I try to find uh, time every day, but we're just so busy here. She was in bed all day. <laughs> but it's so busy, she couldn't get around to write a letter. Well, they had a routine, you know. They read the newspaper, watched the news, had this and had that. And here she was, mid-fest, 24 hours a day, so busy she couldn't write a letter. <laughs> oh, my. And uh, one of the things I've discovered in life is God never expects you to be in two places or do two things at the same time. Uh, Moody used to have an answer out on this deal, Moody. And somebody asked him, well, he kind of uh, was after this businessman because he didn't have time for the Lord's work. And he said, well, I'd like to, but I'm busy with this, this, and this. And Moody said, if you're too busy to do the Lord's work, you've got more business than God intended you have. <laughs> But this is just not meeting together for coffee. Yes. Yeah, this is a, a you have a project. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, group I met with uh, weekly, it's supposed to be a Bible study, but they've got a, an orphanage project they uh, support. Every week they have a basket out there. People oh. kick into the basket. Okay. The project. So that's enough of an outreach? Is that, by the way, do they periodically go to the orphanage, or is it in another country? It's, uh, um, I shouldn't know, but I don't. I, I think it's okay. part of the country. Okay. Well, that's a good idea. Okay, now, yeah, okay. So the uh, treasurer of it keeps track of it all the time, you know, and tells yes. them what they're doing. Yes. So that's on the simpler side, isn't it? Yeah. It's not like they have to put a lot of hours in. But like I told the uh, Brazilian, alumni, you know, well, not a Bible study, but a project, yes. and raise money for these new uh, staff coming on down there. You can do that. They were all successful in business. They could do that. Mm -hmm. But we have to have a, uh, a desire to, don't you like those words, storm, conquer, and hold at least one outpost in the mm -hmm. kingdom of God? That was Sam Shoemaker. No, that was East Adelaide Jones, I guess it said that. Good. Well, Jim, thank you for that. And uh, we'll chew on this, and thank you very much.